Hey there. Uh, I'm going to try not to project too loudly, um, but I'll be honest, I've had about 11 espressos today and I'm ready to charge through a brick wall. So if I scream at you, I apologize in advance. Um, before we get started, how about a quick round of applause for uh, the hard efforts of Jim and, and Will for getting this together. Uh, it's an awfully fabulous job with uh, uh, far too little recognition. Um, so anyway, I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Uh, uh, living in the kind of diverse world of uh, user experience over the course of the last 15 years, I've uh, come to uh, meet interesting people and share ideas with different folks, and it's always a, a great, great time doing so. So I do appreciate that. Uh, just a quick uh, background on me. I know often people wonder who's the guy up there in the room talking to us. So. Um, yeah, I started out more in the uh, custom product development side, kind of business intelligence and factoring that into technology extensions, but have kind of moved uh, through uh, that into, into a more focused uh, experience consulting practice. Um, had an opportunity to uh, hook up with a few different uh, global brands over the course of my time running digital campaigns, and it's uh, been a blast. Currently, I uh, I'm a co or the founder and president of Visit. We do focus on experience optimization uh, as well as other uh, user experience initiatives. Uh, and I am a uh, co-founder and partner of a uh, experience collaborative called the Verse Network. Uh, Alex Shaw, who is uh, also one of the uh, leadership members here with Nova UX, is my partner as along with uh, Bill Knight, who's sitting front and center smiling at me as he always does. Uh, you know, on the personal front, I am uh, a very mediocre but enthusiastic basketball player and uh, have uh, hopped up with many celebrities as reference there. So I really appreciate uh, getting, to, getting to know you guys here tonight. So as I talk through experience optimization, I, I kind of want to plant a seed of, of foundational pillars uh, to keep in the back of your mind as we're going through this um, because they're good uh, kind of uh, rules of engagement in general for all things when it comes to user experience. So that first principle is a deliver for your users, right? And all that should be founded in a broad audience understanding. The second, uh, content comes first. Do we have any content strategists here? All right. Uh, really, that the idea is that you should lead with content, shape with informed design, and extend through technology. That's a good rule, rule of thumb. And then the last is that it's a process, right? Uh, the idea is you want to be able to enhance digital relationships and experiences in general over time. I'll send you the slide, don't watch it. Uh, this is kind of a broader CX stat. I like it though because it speaks volumes to uh, the experiential nature of what uh, audiences are, are seeking, right? And the fact that um, people are, are putting a greater value on their overall experience ahead of things like quality and uh, price and value is an interesting uh, trend. Um, this is, a, I said, broader C, uh, customer experience stat, but it obviously extends into digital experiences as well. Um, and Walker is a uh, customer experience consulting shop for those wondering. So what does experience optimization mean? Um, well, the textbook definition is the ongoing process of adapting and enhancing digital touch points um, uh, based off of a continued growing understanding of customers and their needs. But the way I like to look at it is experiences are living. Uh, they're breathing entities. They need nourishment and love. They have their own kind of like pseudo Maslow's hierarchy of need. Um, and just like any relationship, needs change over time, right? Um, so the idea that if, you're, if you aren't reinforcing and addressing that digital relationship perpetually, you're in, invariably, um, your relationship is going to fade, okay? And the last thing is look at your, you know, some people uh, work specifically on defined products, some might work for marketing websites or other things. All digital touch points are custom products in a highly competitive space. So looking at things through that lens, I think, uh, kind of shapes a practical application of experience optimization. 
So what it does, um, it uh, puts that prioritization on captured audience insights, and we're going to dig into that in greater fidelity here moving forward. Um, but ultimately, uh, thinking about that continued relationship and, and un growing understanding, being able to incrementally introduce changes um, that fit the needs into your various digital extensions or user experiences. Um, the other benefit is uh, course correction. Uh, because it does focus on kind of um, rapid introduction of enhancements, you can uh, kind of course correct based off of business need and user alignment needs and things of that sort. Um, and then it also validates uh, experience decide decisions ultimately. So before we get into the mechanics of EXO and action, I want to talk a little bit about its driving influence. And none of this stuff is going to come across as new to anybody here. But I think uh, you know, kind of setting a baseline of of the key factor driving experience optimization is a, is a good place to start. So Forbes says it's got to be legit, right? Um, you know, it, it, it does kind of showcase the the. the uh, the influence of a positive uh, strategic user experience can have on the success of a product. Okay, when we move into audiences, uh, things that we want to focus on, triggers, needs, behaviors, um, insights, uh, how you gather them, and then kind of uh, touching a little bit on some broader dialogue opportunities. So who here works with personas? Like, actually works with personas, doesn't just have them printed somewhere. All right, very cool. All right, so uh, I, this is just a representative one, um, but uh, it's, it's good uh, kind of as, a, as a, a baseline ground floor understanding of what critical audience insights uh, you want to be able to track to. So things like demographics, goals and challenges, um, preferred channels, um, things of that, of, that, uh, of that nature. So we kind of look at that as kind of a, a foundational, uh, maybe a little bit more static representation of audience understanding. When we talk about gathering insights, um, we want this to be a, a continued dialogue, essentially, right? Um, so how are we capturing and integrating audience insights? Uh, customer interviews and surveys, uh, user testing, um, behavioral, uh, kind of analyzing the behaviors via analytics, and then other available third-party um, research, things of that nature. Um, as far as that broader dialogue, when we talk about this, there are other extensions, things like what's the customer software, um, chat, uh, chat logs, uh, customer service logs, experience surveys, uh, things that extend a little bit deeper, um, which allow you to gain even, even uh, further insight into, into um, Who's, who's visiting your, your, or leveraging your products. Any uh, middle school math buffs in the room here tonight? We got the transitive property up here for you. I, I try to impress people. Um, but anyway, the idea is better insights equals a better understanding. Better understanding is better experiences. Better insights, better experiences. So now I'm going to move on to EXO in action, right? So what does this what does this kind of entail? Where do we start, and how, how what does it look like? Okay, so this is an interesting statistic: uh, Decibel Insight, which happens to be um, a product and a company that services that product that works with LexisNexis. So I think we can trust the stat. Um, but you can see by uh, continually investing on a recurring basis into optimizing their, their web presence, they uh, drove revenue by 81%. Um, pretty significant. I want to take a step back and, and look at some of the factors that feed into experience optimization, because I think sometimes people immediately assume that represents uh, you know, your, your customers and then um, your design team or, or your, your uh, internal resources that kind of uh, push initiatives to, the, to a site or to a product. Um, it starts with all with, with your core, right? And the core is going to consist of your culture, kind of what kind of environment you're working in. Is it progressive? Um, is, are you capable to, to kind of uh, introduce more uh, progressive uh, digital strategies? Um, 
And, and, and that also kind of impacts feature strategy. From strategy, you move on to your enablers. And these are your people, processes, and technology, and data. Essentially, uh, those kind of extend uh, the, the initial strategy and that core culture. And from that, you get outputs. And the way we see this, uh, outputs represent experiences. And the experiences, in turn, continue to feed culture and strategy and kind of this, this continuum moving forward. So I think from that, uh, when you're looking at kind of more um, tactical application of EXO or experience optimization initiatives, it's good to have a kind of a firm understanding of how that resides within within um, your your core enablers and outputs. All right, let's talk about table stakes, things that are, are, are absolute musts for you to be able to kind of introduce this processes or methodology into your practice. Uh, for starters, um, you got to have audience engagement strategy. And when I say audience engagement, I'm not necessarily speaking from the user in engaging with specific uh, features or functions within your product. I'm talking about how you are communicating directly with them. Um, you got to have a testing protocol, uh, how you're going to um, validate some of the decisions that you make and get real uh, quantitative data that speaks to uh, performance. Um, the next thing you got to have, you got to have an analytics uh, and, and a measurement plan. Um, uh, people often uh, do have uh, mechanisms in place, whether it's uh, Adobe Analytics or Google, I'm not using Google Tag Manager, but um, these these, note, uh, these numbers often just float in the nether realm and, and don't actually get tied to actual KPIs. So you got to have that measurement plan in place. And the last thing is you got to have organizational commitment. And that touches a little bit about things like digital maturity, what kind of practice you're working within, um, things of that nature. But, but also, um, you know, uh, people, uh, thinking of things in, in a in more incremental fashion as opposed to uh, long kind of um, structured project engagements that they're accustomed to. Two things that are, are really critical in, in, in kind of making sure um, that experience optimization initiatives are, are successful uh, is a, a constant loop of prioritization and alignment. Um, prioritization drives impact um, and, and this really involves um, integrating uh, your ex user experience teams uh, with business owners and product owners who can define specific uh, priorities. Um, it's your responsibility to find that, uh, that mesh point between business objective and user need um, and, and really uh, consistently aligning um, activity uh, expectations um, with with uh, the user, uh, the um, with respect to understanding of the user and the business need, uh, should be habitual. Uh, ultimately, uh, prioritization drives impact. Alignment builds consensus. All right. So for starters, this is a smart object graphic. I hate it, but uh, I appreciate your guys' patience and understanding. Uh, but it does speak to the fundamental thinking of of experience optimization, kind of phased approach. In, in a continuum. Um, a couple of things, uh, the nomenclature you see up there, it really doesn't matter. This is kind of how we spin it at uh, my company. Um, but the idea of kind of phasing things in uh, based off of an understanding, a plan, a production schedule, um, having the ability to adapt, and then repeating is, is really the ultimate takeaway from that. So audit, um, essentially, uh, when we look at an audit, we're looking to identify what are, this, what are the elements within an experience or, or that dictated the success of an experience and, and really focus and kind of identify where strengths and weaknesses are. It gives us kind of a general landscape and a lay of the land, so to speak. Um, and, and, and will kind of shape activities moving forward. Uh, this can be a recurring process. Um, sometimes the, uh, in, uh, the idea is you're gaining efficiencies as you start introducing um, uh, you know, future audits after, after integrating this methodology. So when we're in the audit phase, we're looking at uh, a couple of audience understanding issues right off the bat. Um, 
Do you have an engagement strategy? What are your testing practices and findings? Um, do you have any two-way platforms or, or things of that, of that uh, nature that can serve additional information and understanding about your audiences? Uh, we want to look at your personas and journeys. Um, how recently have those been touched? Uh, and a big thing here is personalization strategy. Um, uh, you know, I think I think it's starting to emerge um, a little bit uh, more in a more widespread fashion. But really, um, personalization uh, and the execution of personalization is a massive driver of, of uh, building a digital relationship, um, especially uh, within certain younger demographics. Content, content strategies. This one, this one's for you. Um, we we lead with content, so uh, we want to take a look at uh, the qual uh, the qualitative value of your content. How is it performing? How is it set up? Uh, is it digital friendly? Um, its portability. Are you using structured content? Uh, can it extend uh, effectively across uh, di uh, different digital mediums? Um, we'll do a gap analysis. Okay, um, what's missing? Uh, what are, what's needed is it aligned with uh, your business needs. Uh, then we'll over, take a look at the overall digital proficiency. Um, you want to make sure that uh, uh, you're communicating through not only copy, uh, but also kind of um, vis visually through images, graphics, or functions and features. It is the biggest strategic differentiator in experience. So don't ever use more of some people. Uh, next, we'll move into uh, usability. Um, really, we're looking at kind of uh, easy use, uh, core function effectiveness. Um, are the appropriate audience members able to access information, complete transactions, things of that nature? Um, and, and, and also taking a look at uh, best practices and accessibility as well. Um, so that's a growing, growing concern as well, uh, spoken to at our last US event. Uh, experience design. Okay, here we're looking at things like brand effectiveness, um, overall visual design proficiency. Uh, we want to think about if content is kind of the brain or we're leading con with content, experience design is, is like the heart. Um, I like uh, sappy parallels, so I apologize. But um, it's kind of really ultimately uh, what, what gives that, that feel. Um, we look at things like interaction strategy as well. Is it, is it uh, not only is how is it interacting specifically with the user, is it a tactile kind of feel? Does it have that, that kind of tangible connection? Um, things of that nature. And then we'll also do an experience gap analysis. Analytics. Um, you know, I touched on it a little earlier about the importance of actually connecting analytics with a measurement plan um, that aligns with KPIs. Um, you'd be shocked. Uh, some of the some of the organizations um, that uh, still don't actually put out a monthly readout that speaks to their business needs. Um, I won't throw anybody out by name, but I'll just say it rhymes with nails force. Um, and, uh, and you know, in, in thinking about how um, these elements are, are going to kind of feed decisions moving forward, right? Um, so it's critical those, those are in good standing to kind of aid with uh, tracking the performance of your, your experiences. And some of the other elements that I, I, I put up here aren't really ones I want to dig too much into, but these are also elements of consideration that depending on the nature of, of the product that you're supporting. Um, one thing to note, uh, you know, robotic process autom automation readiness. Um, Starting to start to see this more and more come up in, in some of the engagements that I'm part of of recent. So, something to look into for those who are curious. Um, from there, uh, we like to create like a scorecard, right? Because that gives us our benchmark. It shows us uh, kind of a baseline for where we're at overall. Um, it helps us kind of identify where there are issues or where priorities may be where we need to focus. Uh, and then it, it really also can serve for people who are working for, within internal teams and groups can help build a business case uh, for change. This is just a thematic representation of the scorecard. 
Um, but you can see what we like to do is kind of break out those five key areas, uh, and then maybe actually put an industry score um, just to uh, for, for provide further um, kind of perspective on, on where you're at. We'll talk a little bit about digital maturity uh, a little later on here. I'm not gonna go into great lengths about it because I think that positions us to start talking about things like digital transformation. Uh, that's a little bit of a creep. Um, but that uh, that's also something that can kind of speaks to where you're at within the grand scheme of uh, digital readiness. How many people here work in Agile currently? Okay, cool, good number. Um, well, great. Uh, it, you know, when we think about a plan, we want a living roadmap. So this really could be representative of a backlog. Uh, but things to really consider uh, measurable objectives, um, overall alignment with needs, and is it actionable? Um, the, you know, as far as activities and, and tasks that are identified for whether it's updating a specific feature, if it's redesigning a certain element, if it's moving a call to action, all these elements have to be grounded in a measurable objective. And the less anecdotal decision making that's made within an experience, uh, the better. Um, success should be quantifiable. That's ultimately kind of the takeaway. So as you're starting to build your plan uh, of activities or your action plan, uh, you wanna make sure that it can be tied back to measurable objectives and goals. Um, the second thing is align with needs. Uh, you know, satisfying the business need is, is obviously critical, um, but making sure that it's consistent with the user need is also radically important. Um, so making sure that uh, activities as planned uh, meet the challenges of the user uh, is, is very significant. Um, ultimately, uh, you gotta think broadly as you make changes, does it serve the overall benefit of the experience, uh, or are you, you, you know, creating work for the sake of creating work? Um, and then the other thing is, you know, constant prioritization and approval from your product owner or business owner uh, is, is critical. Is your plan actionable? Uh, obviously the what's, why, how, who, and when, um, and do the activities fit, uh, fit the actual resources that are available. Um, you know, as a, as a consultant who likes flowery plans and documentation, uh, lightning might strike me down for saying this, but uh, strategic planning is only as good as it is feasible. And now we move into the actual work phase, right? Conceptualization, design, implementation, um, those kinds of uh, updates. Um, execution uh, is, is important to a we talked about having those kind of measurable goals having it uh, be aligned to specific prioritized activities and the other thing is having kind of time locks uh, whether it's put specifically into work periods uh, if you use uh, sprints or if you use day markers uh, but segmented so it can it can be um, prioritized pushed into uh, production uh, and then measured and then we're going back to realignment. Uh, because sometimes, as you guys know, when you start to put pen to paper, things change and evolve. So, you know, realigning with the needs of a, uh, with, with the organization, your, your product owner, your business owner, and then double checking with the uh, uh, user needs based off of your understanding uh, is important. And, and really, this gives you an opportunity to kind of galvanize uh, your measurement criteria. Once we moved and we pushed, now we're in the adapt phase here. So we've, we've pushed our changes live. We want to see how they are performing. It's time to validate and test, and then from there, uh, continue to enhance. So um, one thing to note about testing, I'm sure you know with this group, people are familiar with AB or added user testing or or things of that nature. Don't forget about uh, quanti qualitative testing. Uh, whether you're engaging through customer interviews, whether you're, you're using uh, more open-ended surveys. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the, the quantitative, uh, you know, information you get from A-B testing or, or from, um, you know, user behaviors through analytics is critical. 
I think uh, people often lose direct touch uh, with, with the end user and actually hearing it straight from the horse's mouth uh, through an interview can be quite valuable. So just one thing to, to note on that front. Um, as far as uh, validating, again, this gives you the opportunity to um, align with your initial goals and obje or objectives before making, uh, making your uh, experience enhancements. Um, you can also kind of validate performance based off of other channels uh, and audience information that you have. Um, and then the big thing is uh, over communicating specifically with uh, your, your business product owner um, metrics, you know, uh, informed design decisions that are, are validated based off of user behaviors. Um, and if there are any gaps in findings, uh, this, this gives you an opportunity to identify those and react accordingly. And then as far as enhancement goes, um, you know, I think people uh, will, will be, even in this kind of experience optimization type methodology or, or line of thinking, uh, will fall asleep on certain aspects that are performing well on the site. Um, so just a kind of general rule of thumb here, um, you know, obviously identify areas that are user challenges or that are underperforming uh, based off of whether it's your testing or, or from the analytics that you're capturing. Um, but also be mindful to continue to, to monitor the behavior of elements that might be performing to the expected standard. So here's just kind of like a, a sample timeline. Um, this can be extraordinarily customizable based off the needs and the organization that you're at. But here you can see this is over the course of 12 months. Uh, this is one that we've actually integrated with the Centers for Disease Control, uh, which I'll speak about here shortly. Um, but you can see that first phase was kind of an audit phase where we spent about two months really digging in, getting a formal understanding with the idea that moving forward, that audit phase would be trimmed and, and, and things would continue to improve and move more efficiently. So as optimization kind of pushes out throughout and, and we break it, we break things out typically in, in 90 day windows, you can see there are alignment and validation check-ins at, at uh, every, every fourth month, essentially, um, which again, allows us to kind of validate our efforts, uh, check in on progress, ensure that we're, we're uh, really making the most efficient use of time and resources uh, against business goals. So again, it's, here it's kind of linearly represented, but the idea is that it is a, a continuous process um, moving forward. Um, so the audit plan, produce, adapt, repeat. Um, you know, like I said, the, the, the nomenclature isn't really the critical aspect. It's more of identifying key phases and extending them in a continuous loop. So I want to talk a little bit about digital maturity here um, because it does kind of uh, factor in uh, or at the organizational level in, in, in introducing some of these concepts. Um, really, as far as, uh, well, give me a quick stat here. I, I like this one. It's from a, an entrepreneur business publication. It's not a show on that geo, which also shares that name, but um, I like it because although it's such a ridiculous range, its worst case scenario is still a hundred percent return on investment. So, um, you know, user experience matters. So, uh, digital maturity essentially kind of assesses the the, the status of digital capabilities um, and 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 their ability to continue to uh, expand, grow, transform, and improve. And there are, there are a few stages. Uh, most people use four. There's the early, these are gonna be kind of relatively mature organizations. Uh, they don't have necessarily a sophisticated uh, team of resources to support uh, or understanding or commitment. The second is uh, developing. Um, this is actually the, the section that most companies reside in. Uh, they have some uh, understanding of of uh, you know the importance of experience, they have cert certain mechanisms in place to support um, a wide array of digital products, um, but they're not really uh, dedicating the appropriate um, amounts of time and resources to grow that. 
Uh, maturing is a pretty robust platform of, of uh, digital products and uh, kind of a will and commitment associated with supporting them. And then optimizing is uh, really the last stage of maturity and they're more influential in shaping general trends and behaviors across the entire kind of digital ecosystem. As far as some of the attributes here, we think about strategy, leadership, talent tools, experience, focus, and culture. Um, early early uh, maturity folks, you know, they're, they're worried about cost reduction. Uh, they're underinvested from a tools perspective. Typically are pretty risk averse and non-integrated, um, thinking very transactionally about how they develop and support their digital products. Uh, developing, um, they're focused on improving the digital customer experience. Um, they are focused, uh, they're a little bit more invested uh, but from a time, resource, and money perspective, um, and they're a little bit more risk tolerant. Um, maturing companies are uh, digitally sophisticated. Um, they are uh, kind of investing an adequate amount of attention, talent, and tools. Uh, and it's a, a core feature or focus of their culture. Um, and uh, they're risk receptive, right? So they're, they're enabling things like innovation and collaboration. And then lastly, that optimizing. Um, really, they, they're, they're kind of digitally influential uh, and, and their, their experience focus is transformative, right? They're looking to push the industry, change things. Like Oracle, there you go. Uh, just looking at kind of just uh, some of the dimensions associated with maturity, culture, strategy, experience, uh, processes, um, and then tech and, and, and data. Um, it, it really, the important kind of takeaway from this is as, as you're, you're kind of growing through uh, your various stages of digital maturity, um, there's that momentum that's built. And, and why I think this is important, this is kind of a theme, uh, experience optimization services are really kind of like that, uh, that snowball going down the mountain. And as more and more um, uh, commitments um, from an organization uh, appears, um, the, 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 rap the more rapidly uh, digital capabilities and maturity extend. So why does this tie back to this discussion? Uh, as your practice kind of evolves, new channels uh, and opportunities to capture audience insights will become available, um, which will then really facilitate things like introducing experience optimization uh, focuses into, into a more regular practice. Um, really, uh, that you know, having an understanding of where you're at, where you work, or who you're working for, or who you're supporting through a cons consultative fashion uh, will really allow you to kind of shape an approach uh, and, and, and make the most efficient use uh, of, of your time supporting uh, digital initiatives for them. So we'll talk a little bit quickly about a case study here. Um, the CDC, the Public Health Professionals Gateway, um, we, we signed a, uh, a three-year contract uh, with them, which uh, basically sold them on the idea of uh, leveraging experience optimization um, as a kind of a global driving force. Uh, this particular group within the CDC, um, they support state, local, tribal, and territorial uh, public health professionals, which is a little over 10,000 uh, public health professionals. Uh, they have a substantial amount of content on six different unique digital properties. Um, and uh, it's an interesting uh, case study because of they're relatively low on the digital maturity fronts, um, despite being well funded and extraordinarily bright folks, um, not a substantial uh, amount of commitment or understanding within uh, experience in general. Um, they uh, had pretty rigid technical restrictions overseen by kind of their global uh, mothership that manages all their digital properties for the entire agency. Um, the you know the, the business owner, uh, we can't really say product owner, but business owner uh, had a little bit of understanding of UX, but a uh, substantial amount of intellectual curiosity, which was actually quite beneficial. Uh, and and their, that curiosity drove um, 
really kind of a passion for her, our approach. Um, and then, of course, working within large organizations, bureaucratic nature of it kind of slows the process from decision execution. Uh, so um, that was painful at times. So we did that initial audit and, uh, of course, found some pretty interesting information, mainly a uh, very limited understanding of who their audiences were um, and what their needs were. Um, you know, the, their, their content was uh, very scientific uh, and not necessarily web effective. Um, there were usability concerns in this hour abound. And uh, ultimately, the experience design was, was, was really struggling. Uh, the biggest shocker to me was their lack of understanding of analytics and use, usage of it. Uh, you would, you know, because initially speaking with a stake, group of stakeholders who are epidemiologists, you have to, you have to come correct with your spreadsheets with these people. Uh, they, they understand uh, numbers very well, but weren't really applying it to any decisions as they extend into um, their digital properties. So that challenge was selling value and incremental enhancement through experience optimization. Um, we went out there, uh, we, we put together quickly a test engagement plan. Um, we wanted to capture audience insights immediately just to get kind of a baseline understanding of how things were operating. Uh, we mapped out activities to, since they are not an agile shop, 30, 60, 90, and 180 day milestones. Um, and really focused on, on that max, maximizing experience value. Um, and then really kind of sold to them the idea of, of crawl, uh, crawl to walk. Uh, we're nowhere near run yet, but the idea of getting off, you know, from crawl to walking um, with these initiatives uh, was, a, was a great place to start. Um, you know, when we, we extended this outreach to their audiences, we did uh, a proctored card sort, uh, which immediately yielded things like uh, what their content needs were, what their core values and, and, and triggers were, um, and how they were aligning uh, certain experience elements. Um, we we uh, then did a uh, customer interviews uh, to identify more specifically what these needs were and validate some of the findings within the card sort. And then we went and actually did guided user testing, um, which really did surface a significant amount of the usability challenges. Um, and, and inform design changes, site architecture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, from this, we were able to start introducing new uh, design um, systems, essentially that could be uh, extended and supported through their uh, thousands of pages on these sites, uh, revamped the IA and architecture, uh, and, and, and kind of did a content scoring, which allowed them to start the process of integrating new content updates that are more web ready, um, focusing in really on the key experience pages. Uh, we also integrated a content object model and style guide, which uh, allowed for even more incremental progressive enhancement of these different pages, um, which allowed them to rapidly impact their design across a multitude of these different sites. Uh, and then we focused on page by page optimization, uh, really kind of digging in deep and making recommendations and updates uh, at that page level. So the outcomes so far so good. Uh, we've jumped in, in, in uh, key experience page engagement by 38%, um, which is meaning a substantial amount of this content is actually reaching its intended targets and useful. Uh, we've had a 17% jump in CRM conversions, people subscribing to their uh, various newsletters. Um, a big one that they weren't able to substantiate from a number perspective, but I, I think this is great. Uh, radical reduction in the customer support requests means that people are finding information on the website and not feeling compelled to reach out. And they did a case study actually at uh, their annual conference uh, about um, this, this you know, engagement. Uh, in, in kind of embracing experience optimization that was featured and uh, awarded at their uh, at their annual conference. So hopefully this begets more opportunities uh, within their organization moving forward. I want to just really <coughs> quickly uh, jump into how some of these ideas and principles can be uh, integrated into your guys' respective practices. Um, so this is pretty interesting as far as you know, only 55% of companies are doing any user testing 
and only 14% are actually regularly communicating with our customers. Um, Skyhook is a location business intelligence shop, um, so they're probably tracking us right now via your phones, um, and they are not Skynet. Uh, make a nerdy Terminator joke, but we'll move on. Um, a couple things right off the bat. Uh, love that product owner. I, I think that uh, in my experience working with uh, cross-functional teams, often there are silos that exist between people who control business decisions and, and drive business priorities and the experienced team that's actually integrating them. Uh, so making a better uh, commitment to understand, uh, over-communicate and align uh, through showed progress is a great way to kind of facilitate more regular uh, enhancement um, across your digital experiences. Uh, revitalize your audience engagement. So take a look at your existing practices as far as um, how you're reaching out to your audiences. What are your tools and methodologies? Um, what is your what does your test plan look like? Um, how frequently are you testing? Are you testing once every three years? Are you testing every major release? Uh, what are ways that you can facilitate the addition of uh, whether it's surveys or interviews or testing on a more recurring basis? And then going back to crawl, walk, run, um, depending on where you work, it's gonna be difficult to start kind of introducing some of the more radical concepts of, of experience optimization. Um, that being said, uh, a lot of the elements can be kind of introduced at that crawl, walk, run thought process of, of just continually to scale and expand um, your experience optimization practices as your as your environment can support it. Uh, so you, you know, as you kind of grow with your practice, uh, so to speak. Uh, the other thing is showing value, um, and, and that can be easily easily accomplished. Uh, if you have the appropriate uh, analytics uh, in place um, to, to, to be able to kind of validate this approach. And that's it, Yang, any, any, any questions? Yes. Um, and, and maybe repeat it for the audio on, on the interwebs. Um, do you have a particular method you like to use to evaluate, score, prioritize that backlog of potential optimizations? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, um, when we go through that first phase of the audit, we identify specifically what those particular needs are. Um, hopefully at that phase, we're meeting with the business owner and product owner and identifying based off of audience, our user needs, and what their business objectives are. And from there, kind of picking activities that have the highest impact based off of that. Um, and then what we do as far as scoring, sometimes we'll apply uh, a burden associated with an activity. So if, you know, uh, not necessarily like a t-shirt sizing or something like that in an agile environment, but more of identifying kind of a value versus burden associated with it. And that helps kind of make decisions on what gets prioritized uh, for initial phases of development or for production. Mm -hmm. um, are there any phases of the process where you feel like um, having a specialization in that portion is more important than the other? I think that, uh, and, and I, I, harp, I harp on this a lot, I think that uh, often places, I, there's a growing, a growing market for this, but I think um, Having content strategy in those initial phases and understanding the actual kind of performance in, in, in the current current landscape and aptitude of a digital experience is radically important. So I, I would say whenever you're in that audit phase, having somebody and you know who can uh, especially identify uh, the performance of content would be beneficial. Um, I thought you know people who have uh, a firm understanding of of um, analytics and data science also uh, might be a little bit more specialized than the standard uh, kind of UX specialist. So having them be able to, to help build measurement plans uh, is, is also kind of an area where I think it's helpful to have a more uh, rigid division of labor and having kind of specialists be able to support businesses. But the idea is, um, you know, fundamentally as a, as a UX person, um, you know, you would have the ability to speak to best practices and things of that nature, 
uh, in each of these phases and kind of guide the process, steward the process. Well, Bill, I know you got a question. Covered it well, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I was going to ask, something like CDC, uh -huh. do you have actual revenue targets that the business comes and asks you for? So if you're going to go up to a company uh -huh. and say, yeah, give us X money to do X work, uh -huh. experience optimization, what are they, how do you validate actual revenue? So, yeah, it, it depends on the organizational KPIs. For them, they're not necessarily focused on revenue. They're focused on, on engagement. They want to know who, if their information is getting, which in a perfect world, it'd all be revenue driven because it's, a, it's the most easy conversion to, to track and substantiate. Really, what they're looking, really in their particular instance, they recognize they have a very diverse, far ranging audience. And being able to service them critical uh, public health information effectively with good delivery uh, is is really their 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 objective. Also, they get they get cut money that they have to spend, which also works out to, to our, our benefit. But uh, but really, so so th those KPIs are typically going to be engagements, uh, content delivery, um, subscription to certain. Uh, newsletters, getting and, and then more anecdotal feedback that they get from their key stakeholders or uh, audiences. So, which uh, what kind of groups did you end up working with? You know, you mentioned stakeholders. Like, who were they? And then, like, through the three-year process, like all the, the content folks, whatever. So, we? so we had our engagement model is really focused on that kind of core team, which is typically their web production team, their communications team. They're the general conduit, and then we actually inter, in a, we, they bring in SMEs from the different content production areas. Somebody who might be specializing in and influenza or, or inoculations or things of that nature who would come in and, and validate and share some, some thoughts. But typically uh, with, with that engagement, it was the communications team that was kind of the day-to-day -day content, our contents. And then we would uh, scale as necessary, especially when we start doing more uh, research and, and, and better understanding of, of, of you know, what they were looking to accomplish. Most of the time we're working with communication, marketing, or product. <laughs> Sometimes we work with technology, um, but but uh, that's usually how, how we roll. So um, uh, at one point you had uh, there was an audit that mm -hmm. you did, but the, and you had like an industry score yeah. and like a company score. Where do you get the industry score? So uh, usually we'll use third party research. So uh, a sometimes we'll go out and we'll actually go through the same exercise on, on competitors to derive one. It depends on on the organization, uh, but sometimes we'll pull things from Forrester, uh, or or um, we'll we'll. It, it, it depends on the nature. I like doing actually a competitive landscape where we'll do a combination of third party research and we'll actually go out and conduct some of the surface level reviews of, of their existing um, uh, existing uh, digital performance. Um, it's a little bit faux. Uh, it just depends on, it's easier, it dep depends on who we're working with, what we're specifically looking to uh, improve and how well that 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 directly impacts how we can really substantiate things like a scorecard and and how that's relative across the industry. But there are there are third party um, research materials out there that can kind of speak to. They're usually more digitally transformation focused since that's kind of like the buzzy thing over the course of the past five years or so. Um, but you can still find some some tips and tidbits and can kind of shape a, a general understanding. And we try to keep things a little bit. Um, broad when we're talking about scorecards because um, you know not everything is a, is a metric driven driven thing in this. In being a three year engagement, is part of is part of your responsibility to also evangelize and bring people up to speed and create a team, or what does that handoff look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is no handoff. Uh, we're we're in the throes. Uh, the idea is we teach them to fish to some some degree. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we built a three-year roadmap of kind of key initiatives that we would want to prioritize. We work with them on, a, on essentially a 90-day basis to reprioritize those activities based off of their needs and how things shift. Uh, but the idea is essentially we set some, the strategic 
kind of uh, theme, um, we produce uh, some of the, the visual architecture um, and, and kind of key experience assets. And then they, they actually take it and run with it. They do have some design resources. They, their technical team integrates it. And then we kind of come back and, and continue to work with them and improving it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, going back to the uh, audit process, you mentioned something about branding effectiveness. Yeah. How do you measure that? So uh, one thing we can check and see is, is, is are there brand gaps? Like, is it, are you effectively communicating uh, your brand across multiple um, channels? So that, that's the first, you know, first thing to kind of, to kind of identify. Also, um, when we think about a brand, we're not only thinking about the visual aspects of that brand, we're thinking about how your core message, what are the brand attributes? What is it built from? Does this design system match those brand attributes? Um, you know, your core beliefs, because really you brand, you brand from the inside out, right? So ultimately you wanna make sure that the outwardly brand effectiveness is reflecting your key values, cores, core wants, and, 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 and things of that nature. So there are different ways you can kind of go about it, but uh, first thing, the most obvious thing is kind of really taking a look and saying, okay, why is your brand reflected this way? on this website, but on your product website, it's radically different. You know, things, things of that, that nature. All right. Good stuff, I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for your time. Uh, you've been a great audience. Awesome. Please take a look.